Okay, so we're back. Uh, so this is a little talk that I've been running around doing, I don't know how many times I've done it now, on Bayesian item response theory uh, using Stata. This was something that was an unintentional happy coincidence, whatever you call these things, serendipity. Mm -hmm. There was no intention with Stata 14 to do Bayesian IRT. So we did Bayes and we did IRT, but uh, anyway, I'll explain more about that as we go. So this is kind of a fun topic. Here's a little outline of what uh, we're going to do. I do want to go through a brief history of how this came about, mostly because it's kind of fun. And then uh, I'll spend a bit of time on item response theory. I don't know how many of you are familiar with IRT and the concepts and ideas. Some places I go, a lot of students are familiar, and certainly faculty, but they're not. So depending on your point of view, we're either going to do a brief review or a brief introduction to item response theory and what it is. Then I'm going to spend a fair amount of time on Bayesian analysis, because uh, I think like me, most of you were probably trained as frequentist statistics or trained from, trained from that point of view anyway. And you're probably, you've heard, I'm sure, of Bayesian analysis. You may be familiar with some of the terms like priors and posteriors. But I want to go through and, and talk about the concepts and the jargon in some detail. And then, uh, so we'll spend a fair amount of time on that. And then I want to put those two together and we'll talk about Bayesian IRT. And then lastly, we'll answer the, the obvious question is why should we even be doing Bayesian IRT? Uh, it's an awful lot of work to get to do something that we think we could probably just do with maximum likelihood. Uh, so we'll come back and address this question at the end. So uh, in state of 12, we released structural equation modeling, among other things. And then in state of 13, we ramped it up to what we call generalized structural equation modeling, or GSIM, which you've now seen. And I kind of mentioned while we were talking about GSIM that IRT models can be fit using GSIM. <coughs> Uh, because they're special case. And so you could do IRT in state of 13, but you kind of had to know how to do it and how to set it up as a G set. So in state of 14, we actually made this very easy. And there are some things that, anyway, I'll spare you the details. We made it much, much easier to fit item response models in state of 14. But it is essentially running G sim as the computational engine in the background. We also uh, added Bayesian analysis to state of 14. But what's interesting is there was never any intention for the two of these to work together. They were developed by two different teams on two different floors of the development building. And it wasn't until after the release that we started playing with these things that we realized that they could work together, sort of. So essentially what happened was after the release of 14, I ran around last year talking about item response theory. And when I got to the IMPS, the International Meeting of the Psychometric Society in Beijing last year, uh, I had a person in the audience who insisted that we should have set the defaults up. Basically, we should have been doing Bayesian IRT for what's called a 3PL model. That it's really, we shouldn't even be bothering with maximum likelihood. So it was an interesting statement, and when I left Beijing last year, I thought, well, when I go home, I want to see if I can figure out a way to fit IRT models using Bayes. Because our Bayes MH command is very flexible. You can fit all kinds of models with it. So I suspected there was a way to do this with Bayes. Well, before I could get around to it when I got home, my friend Sophia, who happened to have been in the room during this talk, she beat me to it. She went home and uh, figured out, she and her students figured out how to fit one parameter logistic models using Stata. So they were very excited. She emailed me the, the code for how to do this. But the problem was it was running very slowly, uh, on the order of hours instead of seconds. And so internally, we took a look at the, uh, the internal code of Bayes MH. And it turned out there were some very minor tweaks that we could make to Bayes MH that reduced the runtime from hours to seconds. Literally from taking about 20 hours to fit a 1PL model to about 2 or 3 seconds. Uh, and it was very minimal. It was just we had never intended for Bayes MH to do IRT. But once somebody thought to do it, there were some things. So since we released 14, we've made some changes to Bayes MH and the internal code that makes the stuff run much, much, much faster. The other thing we did after this was we modified the syntax slightly. So if you've seen early versions of Bayes MH, in fact, the original blog entry that we put up about doing Bayes and IRT, we've had to go back and edit it because we actually changed the syntax of the Bayes MH command uh, to make this a little bit easier. And so this is what I think is a nice example of state of being responsive to users where just because we're between releases and we have other things going on, if there's something that comes up that's you know fairly simple and people want to use it, we'll actually go inside and tweak things and change things along the way to make things work better. Uh, the other thing is it's kind of fun that it was just a, a total serendipity. Um, and so as I was going along putting these slides together, I kept thinking of this commercial from the 1970s. 
which some of you may be old enough to remember, but some not. There was this TV commercial I kept thinking, oh, I wonder if that's still around. So I looked it up on YouTube and I embedded it in my slides. And I hope the sound on here isn't about to blow us out of here, but I copied the, found the commercial on YouTube. Okay, we don't have to have the sound. I just didn't want it to get super loud, so. Anyway, it's an old Reese's peanut butter cup commercial where I guess this is me walking down the street with my IRT and, and, and Prince Sophia's walking along with her tub of bays. <laughs> and then some dorky guy comes along and says, oh, Reese's peanut butter cup. It really was one of these fun. It really was one of these fun things where two things just came together like that and they work really well together. So that's just the silly brief history for fun. So what the heck is IRT, item response theory? Uh, so let's imagine that we have a, a test of some sort, or an instrument, as uh, people often call it in the psychometrics world. And uh, we have questions on this instrument, or items as they're often referred to. So we have items on instruments. And the questions could look something like this. Which of the responses below is not a method of estimating parameters? So we have four possible responses. Response C is the correct response. And the point I want to emphasize here is that even though I have four possible responses, I'm going to treat this as a binary outcome. It's either correct or it's incorrect. Okay? And it doesn't matter if I have three possible choices or five possible choices. At the end of the day, it's binary because it's correct or incorrect. So that's what we're going to focus on only binary outcomes today. You can have ordinal outcomes and other things, but we're going to focus on binary. So once we collect data using our instrument, uh, we might want to take a look at the items, the specific items. So here's a, a typical thing that we would do with those items. We would want to plot something called a characteristic, item characteristic curve. The horizontal axis of this thing is the latent trait ability, the overall ability of the person. And you can kind of think of this conceptually as though we took the, the overall test score on the entire test, and we took the scores, subtracted off the mean and standard, but divided by the standard deviation, so that we put the test scores on a z-scale, z-scale axis, z-score axis. Uh, it's not literally what it is, but that's kind of the idea behind this latent trait ability. So it's their overall performance on the entire instrument. Then the vertical axis is the probability of correctly answering a particular item given the person's overall ability, which is why you see this sort of S-shaped logistic curve. So the idea is that the higher a person's overall level of ability, the more likely a person is to answer a particular item correctly. At least the idea. <laughs> Sorry, I have to laugh. Yeah, it's <laughs> not always true. Um, and so there are three attributes of items that we're interested in. First is the difficulty of the item. So if this curve were to shift to the right, we would say that I, that item is more difficult because only people of higher overall ability levels are likely to get that question correct. Whereas if the, the curve were to shift to the left, we would say that that item is easier because people with lower levels of ability are still likely to answer that particular question correctly. So the left to right shifting of the curve is referred to as the difficulty, and it's measured in z-scale, uh, z-score scale. <coughs> the discrimination is the slope of this curve. So imagine as an extreme case that this curve came flat over to zero, went straight up to one, and then continued over that item would perfectly discriminate between people of above or above or below average ability, right? Because it, it's just straight up and down right there. <clears throat> well, that doesn't happen in practice, but the steeper the slope is, the more it discriminates between people of certain ability levels. And so it's nice when you're designing an instrument to be able to have different questions that have different slopes and, and different difficulties so that you can kind of get a range of these uh, uh, features. The last thing we're interested in is the probability of guessing. Uh, because it's a finite number of possible answers, responses, someone could just be guessing. They may not have know anything about the subject and they just check B and it happens to be correct. So those are the three attributes of an item we're interested in. The item's difficulty, the item's discrimination, the slope, and the probability of guessing for a particular item. Okay, any questions about that? So for, as an example, uh, this is a data set that comes from a paper by DeVoke and Wilson. It's real data. I forget how many observations. Oh, 800. Uh, so these are nine items uh, numbered Q1 through Q9. And at the bottom, I've tabulated question one. So out of 800 respondents, I have 298 that answered this item incorrectly and 502 that answered this uh, item correctly. And so what I'd like to do then is, is fit an item response model for this collection of items. So in state of 14, we put together a nice graphical user interface to make this simple. So this is the, uh, the command 
window for doing IRT. Down the left hand side we have different uh, tabs here, kind of like tabs, where you can either specify the model or create reports or do graphs and, and we'll talk about this other stuff momentarily. So in the model tab, the model pane, uh, we can select what kind of model. And at the top we have binary models, one parameter logistic, two parameter logistic, and we'll come back to what those are momentarily. But we can also fit models for ordered outcomes or fit partial credit models or categorical <laughs> outcomes. We can even fit hybrid models that combine uh, each of these. So if you had a combination of binary and ordinal, you could fit all of those in a model simultaneously because, again, they're GSIM. It's running the GSIM in the So we could fit a one-parameter logistic model, and then we could create a report for this, and the report would look something like this. I have a, the characteristic of a one-parameter logistic model is that I'm going to fit a separate difficulty parameter for each of the items so they can all shift left to right. But I'm going to constrain all of the slopes to be the same. I'm going to assume that the slopes are the same across all of the, the items. So I have a single discrimination parameter and separate difficulty parameters. Next I can create graphs. I'm going to plot the item characteristic curves, but there are information functions and other things that you can graph. But if I were to graph the results of this model using a one, one parameter, one PL logistic model, uh, all of the slopes are the same, and you know, we constrain them to be the same, but the difficulties are shifted left to right. So, for example, this is green. I believe that's question five. Would be more difficult than, what is that one? Question eight, which is on the far left. Okay? So that's what we would, how we would sort of evaluate these items relative to each other. Okay, and so <coughs> we might want to just plot two curves if we wanted to uh, compare two questions. So again, in this particular example, question one would be easier than question two, or flipping that around, question two would be more difficult than question one because its curve is shifted slightly to the right. Uh, we can also do something called uh, differential item functioning. And there are a couple of different flavors of differential item functioning. One is called uniform diff. Diff is short for differential item functioning. The other is non-uniform diff. So uniform diff means that I have the same item, but I've given the, the instrument to two different groups, maybe males and females, or minorities and non-minorities, or treated and controls sometimes. And what I'm looking for is just a side-to-side -side shift and the, uh, the difficulty for the two groups. That would be uniform diff. Sometimes the curves are just shaped fundamentally differently. And so that would be an example of non-uniform diff. And so you can examine both of those uh, using status. Sometimes this is a good thing, sometimes not. Usually diff is considered a bad thing. So you have differential item functioning for fe males and females. You generally don't want that, particularly with SAT questions and things. Certainly for minorities and non-minorities, but sometimes if you had a treated and an untreated group, that might be a good thing. Um, but anyway, so that's diff. We can also put a two-parameter logistic model. So here we can free up uh, the slope parameter, so we estimate a separate slope for each item. And uh, often you get this graph that looks like a spaghetti bowl of colored spaghetti, multicolored spaghetti. And we can then also fit a three-parameter logistic model that again allows for guessing. And what that guessing parameter is going to do yeah. is, is lift up that lower asymptote because the probability of no one answering correctly is, is small because some people are just guessing. Okay. So those are the three kinds of models that you could fit for binary outcomes uh, using state of using the traditional maximum likelihood style IRT. Question? Ask about parameters. How many parameters do you have altogether? Available parameters? Because you said you started with one parameter, two parameters. Yes. How are they different? The three parameters are the slope. Uh, let me back up. So there are three possible parameters for each item. There's the difficulty parameter, the shifting side to side. And then there's the slope parameter, which is how steep this is. And then we can also have a guessing parameter for each item. Um, so there are up to th we have nine items, and we have three parameters per item, so a maximum of eight, 18 possible parameters total. But it depends on the kind of model you fit. So with the 1PL model, which is this one, we've only estimated 10 parameters. One difficulty for each of the items. Yes, one difficulty for each of the items, and then one discrimination parameter for all of them. And because it's a 1PL, we've not estimated a, any guessing parameters. Does that make sense? And then for the two-parameter logistic, now we've freed these up so that we're estimating separate discrimination and difficulty parameters for each, and now we're up to 9 times 2 is 18. 
Wait, I said that wrong. It's 27. 27 if you had all three freed up. Sorry. So now we have 18 total. And then for the 3PL model, we're only estimating a common guessing parameter. So we'd be at 18 plus 1 is 19 parameters that have been estimated in this particular model. So you know, three of them are significant to prediction purposes? Uh, well, you can get that out of the table, but I actually put a, I thought I had a table in here of the output. So you can look at the dis difficulty and discrimination parameters, and it shows you the standard errors and z-scores for each of these. And uh, I didn't show the output for the 2 and 3 PL models, but you can assess the statistical significance of each of the parameters if you want to. And, and so the, the fixing the discrimination one is that the, you would put like an app, and then you put is this that exactly the sign to right. make it fixed? Yes. It. Uh, so it would be at A for all of those, or at whatever you want to name it. So it would be constrained to be the same. We'd estimate one common parameter across all nine. Uh, and then if we put a 2PL model, we'd free that up. Where is it? So then they can each have separate slopes. Now, here's where things got interesting uh, last year with this talk. The 3PL model that we fit in Stata assumes a common guessing parameter across all the items. Mm. You can relax that a little bit and you can have separate guessing parameters for maybe a two or three or four or five groups of uh, items, but you can't free it up and have a, a unique guessing parameter for every single item in the uh, thing because it's not identified. It's too many parameters for it just it blows up. And it's not a Stata thing, it's a math thing. All software has this problem. So last year I ran around doing this IRT talk, and this was my summary slide at the end. I did happen to write Bayesian IRT with a question mark, like, oh, I might be able to do this, but I hadn't had time to play with it and I didn't know. And to be honest, I was more interested in things like maybe multi-level IRT, because when you give an instrument or a test, often it's to kids within classrooms or something, and so multi-level IRT was more interesting to me uh, this time last year. And you might want to incorporate covariates or something like that. I was just sort of brainstorming other things you might want to do with IRT. But Bayes was not high on my list, I have to be honest. But uh, here's a photo of me in Beijing last year. Somebody happened to snap this picture of me and emailed it to me. I don't even remember who it was now, but they, strangely <laughs> enough, got this slot on the summary slide. This is moments before I got a very thorough grilling by a very famous psychometrician who does a lot of work in IRT who explained to me that we should be using Bayesian models for 3PL, Bayesian techniques for 3PL models uh, with informative priors, and that, uh, that we really should just be doing it that way. That's the correct state-of-the-art way to do this. So I went home from Beijing, as I said before, and went to do this, and my friend Sophia got to it before I did. So between the two of us, uh, I happened to have been in San Francisco later. I drove out to Berkeley, and we all sat around in a room with my laptop connected to a projector. And we figured out how to do the 2 and 3PL models, get the syntax. And you'll see why I say figure out, because when you see the syntax for Bayesian IRT models. Uh, we figured all of that out, and then we went back and tweaked it. And so this was, this was all kind of a fun, uh, fun serendipitous sort of an exercise. Anyway, so that's kind of just the basics of IRT. Anybody have any questions about IRT, just the concepts? Yes. Um. Back in the table where you had the output, there was there was one that wasn't significant, and everything else was. Could you just yes. give us an uh, interpretation as to whether or not you should include that at all in the or model, like, or, or does it matter? <clears throat> what does it mean? I'm not a real. I, I know sort of the rudiments of IRT, and okay. I know some of the theory, but as far as the practice of what you would do with that, does anybody you, do you have well, any comments I mean, on? So here's, and I'm, I'm trying to paraphrase. I used to do a lot of work on UCLA's database, uh, and so I used to have a collection of items that I used to mess up for them. There's 13 set of items, student-faculty interactions, and what I would do is use different samples and I'd find different factor constructs for that set of items, ultimately suggesting that this was not a reliable set of um, items that people could use across different samples. They thanked me for doing that and they moved to IRT with the notion that they would have a uniform set of items that would be fairly consistent that could be reliable across sets of samples because they were able to figure out where the items were. People were guessing, um, people were having levels of difficulty in terms of responding to them. And so <clears throat> I found for them that they decided on certain items, um, if they thought conceptually that it still held within that construct, they would use one or two but they wouldn't use a lot of those that they fell out. And they actually removed those questions from the survey. 
So I no longer got to test some of the ones that I've been testing. It's partly because they weren't reliable with that set. Um, and so they made those decisions to kind of um, improve the quality of the survey use across multiple ones because I created problems, at least for that set of items. Because I felt, oh, this was different here, this was different there. You should disaggregate them here. It was fun for me. It was not, not for them. Not for them. So Sylvia told me, he's like, yeah, thank you for that. We appreciate it. Um, and so it, I would say it depends. I mean, if you're doing a survey like I am, we would probably remove that item because we want to have better sense that this was a good set of items that we could rely on. Um, and so that, that would be our decision, but it would be something you want to discuss uh, depending on where you're going with the survey, what you want to do. But you wouldn't make the decision solely on that. No, 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 no. That, that would be a substantive entire, conversation. That would be a substantive conversation yeah. in the entirety of the survey. How long it is, how many groups we've had surveying it, 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 it normalizing the survey, which is what you see most people trying to do that. You wouldn't do it one off, no way. Yeah. And just in general, how would you interpret these? Like, like what what do the numbers actually mean? That um, well, the p value I assume is I assume it's testing whether or not that coefficient is significantly different from zero. Yeah. That's right, the right, literal right. interpretation of the, the test. No, not the p-value, but the coefficient okay. itself. How would you interpret Oh, that is the where it falls. In fact, I need to add a graph in here somewhere. The, uh, so, for instance, for question one, its difficulty is 0.017. So that means, uh, so let me pull up the graph, so because I have question one. That means, if you see this 50% line that's cutting across here, that's the inflection point for this curve. That inflection point, or where it crosses 0.5, if you drop a line straight down there, that is where the difficulty is. So that the difficulty parameter is essentially where that crosses the, uh, the horizontal axis. The horizontal axis. So that 0.7 is right about there. Okay. So, so, it's so wherever that question. line crosses the 50% uh, probability line, drop a vertical line straight down. And you can do that in Stata. There's a checkbox. Just put drop vertical line, and it'll just do that for you. Got it. So, but so that's that, how you interpret it. So yeah, that question is easier on average. Uh, easier, yes, yeah. because it's on the left Let's side of right. zero. Got it. In fact, only what, three of these are greater than zero. Four of them. Four of them are greater than zero, it looks like. The remainder are below. Right. So, Can I ask a question okay. on the same slide? Sure. The T values? Oh, the previous. Yes. So we are using what this fifth model? Yes. And, uh, why? Z, is that uh, just normalized Z value, normal distribution? Is it's a wall test. It's the coefficient divided by the standard error. It's, it's a chi-square test? It's a wall mm -hmm. z-score. You could do it as a chi-square or as a z. Well, just take Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you take the parameter estimate divided by the standard error, and you can either square it and get a wall chi-square, or you could just leave it as a one z-score scale. I, I thought, so, yeah. yeah. But you can do that with any kind of regression. You take the coefficient divided by the standard error, and SAS, I believe, by default, squares it, calls it a wall to chi square. Yeah, if you take a z score and you square it, you get a chi square with one degree of freedom. So it's just the relationship between the distributions. Uh, okay, where are we? All right, so that was IRT. Any more questions about IRT? I know that's a big topic condensed into about 30 seconds, but. Uh, but there's much more to IRT than that. You can have to handle ordinal items and things like that. But for our purposes, we're going to stick to binary outcomes. Bayesian analysis. Okay, what the heck is this stuff? There's an awful lot of jargon and, and concepts and things, so we're going to try and break this down into little pieces and make it digestible. First off, the main thing I want to emphasize is that Bayesian techniques and MCMC are not simply different estimation techniques. It's not like we have OLS or maximum likelihood or Bayes. It's much more than that. It, Bayesian statistics is a fundamentally different paradigm or way of thinking about statistics. So most of us just think in terms of we were trained as frequent as statisticians, and that's what we think statistics is. But there's actually another way of thinking about this. So as frequentists, frequentists believe that model parameters are fixed but unknown quantities in a, a population. So for example, if I, were, if I wanted to know the average height of people in the United States today, if I very carefully define my population, Theoretically, that's a noble number. If I had infinite resources and, and so forth, that is a theoretically noble number, the average height of people in the United States today. Bayesians, on the other hand, believe that 
model parameters or parameters in general are random quantities that have distributions. And they have a special name for this called a posterior distribution. And that posterior distribution is formed by combining prior knowledge about the parameter, we'll be more specific shortly, with evidence that we observe from data that we collect. Okay? So frequentists think that parameters are fixed but unknown quantities. Bayesians see parameters as things with distributions. They're random. Okay? It's a very different way of thinking about statistics. The other thing is this prior knowledge thing is very disturbing to many people because it's considered to be subjective. And there are ways to get around that as well, but uh, I don't want to go too, too far down that road. So Bayesian statistics is named for a guy named Rob, Reverend Thomas Bayes. He was born in 1701 in London. He was actually a Presbyterian minister. He wrote two papers in his lifetime. One was published during his lifetime. It was on uh, theology. The second was in mathematics, and it wasn't actually published until after he died. His friend Richard Price was going through his things after he died, found this paper, and actually published it under Bayes' name. He didn't steal his buddy's paper from him. So uh, how many of your friends would do that for you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, your roommate dies, hey, their dissertation's almost done, you know? Well, uh, so, uh, so his friend Richard Price is really cool. We could have been calling this Priceian statistics yeah. instead of Bayes very easily. The other amazing thing is this is a guy who wrote two papers, only published one during his lifetime, and only one paper in mathematics, or not even really statistics, and has an entire branch of statistics named after him. This guy couldn't even get into graduate school with this CV now, much less than that. And yet he has an entire branch of statistics named after him. So it's pretty remarkable. And uh, he had no idea. All right, so I thought uh, rather than go through a bunch of definitions and things like that, it would be easier to illustrate Bayesian statistics with a simple example. We'll walk through it and see how these concepts fit together. So we're going to work a coin toss example. And so I'm going to toss this coin. What I'm interested in is the probability of heads. And I'm going to use the parameter theta to denote the probability of heads if I toss this coin. So if I'm a Bayesian, the first thing I need to do is talk about a prior distribution. Prior distribution is just my belief about the parameter. It could be based on some sort of experience or knowledge, or it could just be wild guesses, but it has nothing to do with data. It's completely independent of the data. So I need a mathematical way to express my ideas about the, the, my prior beliefs about the distribution. And so in this case, for theta, theta is a probability, right, between 0 and 1. Beta distributions are very useful for modeling things or describing probabilities that are bounded. So I'm going to use a beta distribution to describe my mathematical belief about the parameter theta. So if I were going to be really a real purist, I could say I've never seen this coin before. I know nothing about this coin. Maybe it's heads on the other side. I just haven't seen the other side. I don't know. So I'm going to say that the probability of the theta could take on any value between 0 and 1 with equal probability. I have no idea. And that would be referred to as an uninformative prior. It's not. Uh, it's just saying, I have no idea all probabilities are equally likely. Okay? Now, mathematically, I could do this using a beta distribution with parameters 1 and 1, which is a, a, a uniform distribution, this red line. It's just it's a flat distribution. But if I were to think about this for just more than a couple of minutes, it seems very unlikely that I would toss 10 heads or 10 tails. That doesn't seem very likely just from a common sense point of view. So I might want to uh, describe the probability, my belief about the probabilities, that I think it's somewhere closer to 0.5, but I don't think exactly 0.5. So I might want to describe my belief about theta with a beta distribution with parameters 30 and 30, something that looks like that. That's a graph of a beta distribution with 30 and 30. So even though theta could be anywhere in there, that's where I think it is more likely to be. But again, this is there's no data involved. It's just my mathematical expression of my belief. Now the next thing I would obviously want to do is go out and collect some data. If I can actually get a hold of this coin or one very similar to it, I could toss the coin and count, which is what frequentists do, right? We count the frequency of something. So in this case, I could toss the coin 10 times and record the number of heads out of the number of tosses, and I could store this in a state of data set, and then I could analyze this later on. I could do something with it. But if I'm a Bayesian, what I need to do next is come up with something called a likelihood function that express, mathematically captures the information in my experiment. Binomial distributions are really good for uh, modeling things that have a certain number of successes out of a certain number of trials. So in this case, I have four heads out of ten trials. The binomial distribution would seem to be a good uh, fit for that. 
are a good choice. So here, what I've left my uh, prior distribution on my graph here, and I've also plotted the likelihood function for the binomial with four heads out of 10, uh, 10 tosses. Now I have scaled that likelihood function, so the area under the curve is one. Likelihood functions aren't probability distributions. I mean, they are, but they aren't. they're not scaled the same way. But anyway, I've scaled this so that the area under both of these curves is one, so they're comparable. We're comparing apples and apples with the graphs. But notice two things. One, the, the prior is very steep and it's centered around 0.5. My likelihood function from the data is relatively flat, and it's centered over here above 0.4. So I have my prior belief about the coin toss, the probability of heads, and then I have my actual data. What I need to do if I'm a Bayesian is come up with a way of reconciling these two. I'd like to update my beliefs about theta with the evidence I've collected from the world, which sounds like something we do in science, right? We come up with some hypotheses and we go out and test them. This seems like it's a, a fairly natural thing to do. Well, I do that with something called, by calculating something called a posterior distribution. And in this very simple example, I can just multiply the prior distribution times the likelihood function, and that's my posterior. Now, in real world examples, it doesn't always work out this way. And if you look in Bayesian textbooks, you'll often see instead of equals, a little sideways A looking thing that says proportional to, uh, which means it's kind of like it, but not exactly equal to. But in this case, I want to keep things very simple. It's a nice, simple example. So the posterior is equal to the prior times the likelihood. Now, this is a special case where the prior distribution has a beta distribution. And when I go through and actually calculate my posterior, my posterior also has a beta distribution. And in fact, it's as though I've simply increased my sample size by alpha for the total sample size, and then my number of successes by the beta part. But the point here is that I have my posterior distribution comes from the same distribution family as my prior, which means I have to, I've used something called a conjugate prior. Conjugate priors mean that my posterior distribution has the same functional form or comes from the same distribution family as my prior. And this turns out to be very useful if you're doing uh, research work because if, let's say that I'm doing a pilot study and I start with a completely flat prior. People say, well, these priors are subjective. How do you know? Well, the first time I do an experiment, maybe a pilot study, I could start with a completely flat prior, say, I don't know anything, go out and collect a bit of a pilot data like this. I can update my prior with the evidence from my data by forming a posterior distribution. Now this posterior distribution has the same form as the prior. I could go out and collect full-blown data and use my posterior for my pilot study as the prior for my full-blown study. Does that make sense? And then if you use, do repeat further experiment, experiments <coughs> and refine this, you can continue using your posterior from the previous study as the prior for your next study. So it really does sort of work the way you think that your brain and the way science kind of works in a way. Okay? Because it's not like we don't commit studies with no preconceived notions of any kind. Okay. So here I've plotted, again, the prior is in red, the likelihood function is in blue, and the black graph now, the line, is my posterior distribution. The first thing that jumps out at me is that the posterior looks a lot more like the prior than it does like the likelihood function. The reason for this is because I used a relatively informative prior, it's fairly steep, and I used a fairly small sample size, which is why the, the likelihood function is so flat. If I used the larger sample size, that likelihood function would become more peaked and it would influence the posterior distribution more. So when we're planning Bayesian studies, we need to pay attention to the relative weights, uh, the relative amount of information contributed by the prior and by the likelihood function. Otherwise, one can dominate the other. In this case, the prior is com almost completely dominating the posterior. So what's a, a fun exercise to do is to start off with something like a flat prior, and a completely uninformative prior. And here I've plotted the, both the likelihood and the posterior, but you can't see the likelihood function because it's masked by the posterior. What this shows us is that if a, for a completely uninformative prior, the posterior will be the likelihood function. It will be completely informed by the data. It's as though we've just done a frequentist experiment, okay, or frequentist analysis. But as I let the prior become more informative, watch what happens to the posterior. As the posterior prior becomes more and more informative, the posterior begins to look more and more like the prior. And again, this emphasizes this notion that we need to balance the two. If you're going to use a really strong prior, you probably need a larger sample size. And uh, you probably want to check these to see if, if one is dominating the other. Okay. Any questions so far about Bayes? Okay.
All right, so this was a really simple example, coin toss experiment. We can actually calculate the posterior distribution, the functional form. But in real life examples, particularly item response theory, the math doesn't work out so neatly. And so we can't just do a, a hand calculation for the uh, posterior distribution. So we're going to have to use something called Mark Markov Chain Monte Carlo, or MCMC for short, in order to generate a sample, what we hope is a sample from the posterior distribution, so we can then draw inferences about our uh, parameter. In this particular case, we're going to use <coughs> a flavor of MCMC called Metropolis Hastings. There are a variety of different kinds of algorithms you could use with this, Gibbs sampling and others. But Metropolis Hastings is very common. It's one of the earliest that's been in use. And, and so we're going to just stick with Mark, um, MCMC with the Metropolis Hastings algorithm today. So how does this thing work? Uh, I know it's a bit of a mystery. And so we're going to crack the box open and try and figure out what's going on inside. We're going to break it into three parts, the Monte Carlo part, the Markov chain part, and then see how the Mar Metropolis Hastings algorithm works with this. So. Monte Carlo experiments are experiments where we're going to repeatedly draw numbers from some, random numbers from some distribution. And I am aware that they are pseudo-random numbers, but I get tired of saying pseudo, so I'm just going to say random numbers, okay? <coughs> so for example, I could draw a series of random numbers from a normal distribution with a mean of 0.5, which is some arbitrary standard deviation sigma. We're not going to worry about sigma right now. Uh, so the graph here on the right side is what's called a trace plot. And what I'm going to do is every time I draw a ran new random number, I'm going to increment this thing over so I keep sort of a, a, keep a running track of the values that I generated over the iterations. I'm going to refer to this distribution I'm drawing from as the proposal distribution. Okay? And every time I draw a new number, I'm going to shift it over to the right and increment it so that I can see uh, what's going on here. The graph on the left is simply a density plot, or a histogram, of the values of theta that I've drawn. So every time I draw a new value of theta, I'm going to add that to my density and see what happens to the density. So if I were to repeat this 10,000 times, a couple of things to point out. One, the proposal distribution is staying the same across every iteration. It's not changing at all. It's always normal 0.5 sigma. And the density that results looks kind of like the proposal density, right? And in fact, if I hadn't squished this to make it look fit in the trace plot, it would look exactly like that. You basically get back whatever you drew from. The other thing I want to point out is that this trace plot has a nice kind of squiggly random looking pattern to it. It doesn't have a, a particular pattern, and I'll show you what I mean by a pattern here shortly. So the proposal density is staying the same across all 10,000 iterations, and this is what we get. The Markov chain part, what does this mean? Markov chains are sequences of numbers where each number in the sequence is in some way dependent on the previous value in the sequence. So in this case, theta t, each iteration, is I'm going to draw my, eh, I'm saying this clearly, my proposal distribution is going to change with each iteration. So rather than drawing from a normal distribution with a mean of 0.5, I'm going to draw from a normal distribution with a mean equal to the previous value of theta that I drew. Okay. So let's say, for example, that I have my current state of the proposal distribution is a normal distribution with a mean of 0.712. So the mean is up here. I draw a new random number from that distribution, and it, it equals 0.530. Everybody see that? So now if I draw another number, the next mean, I'm going to center it on 0.53. My proposal distribution is now centered on 0.53, which was the previous draw. I'm going to draw a number, random number from that distribution, which equals 0.41. So I have the mean here, which is the previous value of theta, and the green is my new value of theta. So if I were to repeat this 10,000 times, now my proposal distribution is changing at each iteration, because it's changing with uh, the value, the previous value of theta. So I get this strange wobbly pattern that's referred to as a random walk. Okay? And that's something we don't want to see in our trace plots. When we, when we go back and do some diagnostics after we fit our models, we don't want to see this kind of a pattern. We want to see a nice, smooth pattern like we saw, or, or sort of random looking pattern. The other thing to point out is that the density plot doesn't really look like a real density. It has kind of a cliff hanging off the side. It just doesn't look like anything very useful. So Markov chain Monte Carlo by itself is not it's not everything we need. We need something more. And that something more we need is the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. And there, like I said, there are a variety of these things. There's uh, Gibbs sampling and others. But the way Gibbs uh, Metropolis Hastings works is 
it's an acceptance rejection algorithm. Up to now, we've kept all 10,000 values, right? We generated 10,000 values, we kept them all. Metropolis Hastings is an acceptance rejection algorithm. So we're going to keep some values and we're going to reject others, some proposed values of theta. So here's how it works. After I generate a new value of theta for my proposal distribution, I want to calculate a ratio of the posterior probability using the new value of theta with the posterior probability using the previous value of theta. So if this ratio is greater than 1, that means that the new value of theta has higher posterior probability. It's a better value of theta. I'd want to keep that, right? Well, the first obvious question, if you didn't see this, is that, wait, I don't know the posterior probability distribution. And if I did, I wouldn't be doing this, right? But in fact, it turns out, I don't need to know the functional form of the posterior probability distribution. All I need to do is multiply the prior times the likelihood function assuming the new value of theta and the previous value of theta, and that's good enough to calculate this ratio. Okay. So if this ratio is greater than 1, I want to keep the new value of theta always. But if the ratio is less than 1, I don't necessarily want to discard it, and that's what makes this a little bit confusing. If the ratio is less than 1, I'm not necessarily going to discard it. I'm going to use that ratio that I calculated and call it an acceptance probability. And more formally, I need to define it this way because if the ratio is greater than 1, I don't, for arbitrary ratios, they could be greater than 1. And since probabilities can only be 1, I need to pull this thing back down. If it's greater than 1, the probability, acceptance probability excuse me, is 1. If it's less than 1, that ratio is the acceptance probability. So then the next step is to draw a, uni a num random number from a uniform distribution between 0 and 1 compare that acceptance probability to the random number I drew. If the acceptance probability is greater than that random number, then I'm going to keep the new value of theta. If it's not, then I'm going to revert back to the old value of theta. Then I'm going to keep the old value of theta and reject the, the proposed value of theta. So this is a bit abstract. Let's look at a concrete example of how this works. So let's say that my current value of theta my, for my proposal distribution the mean is 0.517, that's my current value of theta, or actually the previous value. I do a random draw from that proposal distribution and it equals 0.380. When I calculate this ratio, literally like this, beta with this, binomial with this, and do the calculation, the ratio is 1.307. That acceptance probability becomes 1, I keep it, no questions asked, I'm done with the algorithm. So I've kept the new value of 0 0.380. So 0 0.830 in the next iteration becomes the mean for my proposal density. So my proposal density shifted down, the 0.38 shifts to the denominator, and I draw a new value of theta from that proposal distribution, and it happens to equal 0.286. Again, I calculate this ratio, but this time the uh, ratio equals 0.747. It's less than 1, but I'm not necessarily going to reject it. I'm going to hang on to it and use it as an acceptance probability. Then at step 3, I'm going to draw a uniform random number. and In this case, it equals 0.094. When I compare these, 0.747 is greater than 0.094. So I'm going to go ahead and keep the new proposed value of theta. Even though the ratio is less than 1, I'm still going to go ahead and keep it. So now my value of 0.286 becomes, moves to the denominator. It's the previous draw. And now I'm going to draw a new value of theta for my proposal distribution, and it equals 0 0.088. When I calculate this ratio, it equals 0.039. I use that as my acceptance probability. I draw a new random number. I compare the two. This time, my acceptance probability is greater than that number, or excuse me, less than that number. That's not true, so I'm going to reject the new value of theta. It's out. Make sense? So I either accept or reject these values of theta based on this little algorithm. So if I were to repeat this 10,000 times, and this is literally what it's doing, it's going through and doing this algorithm 10,000 times, first off, the proposal distribution is changing, and the red and green dots indicate whether the new value is being accepted or rejected. Green means accepted, red means rejected. And then two features of this. The trace plot has a nice sort of scattered pattern to it. It doesn't have that random walk pattern. We don't want to see that. We do want to see something like this. The other thing is that our density plot looks like a density of some kind. It doesn't look like a normal necessarily, but it looks like something. So if we were to take that density plot and rotate it on its side so it looks like a typical histogram, this is the same density plot just plotted as a histogram, uh, right side up. 
And the red line here, remember I told you we could actually calculate the posterior distribution? This is a simple example. The red line here is the actual posterior distribution, the theoretical posterior. The gray bars are a histogram of that sample that we generated. The blue line is what's called a kernel density estimate. It's a non-parametric smoothing technique. And the uh, punchline of this graph is that the sample that we generated looks remarkably like the theoretical posterior distribution. We now have a sample of 10,000 observations that, that has essentially a beta 5-7 distribution. And this isn't even using Stata's actual MCMC algorithm, which is adaptive and does all kinds of fancy things. This is just literally my homely code that does exactly what I just showed you, that generated all the, the graphics. This is just my little homespun version. The version that runs an actual Stata uh, Bayes MH is much more sophisticated. So the point is we can generate samples from the posterior distribution even when we don't know the functional form of the posterior distribution. So any questions so far about MCMC? Gives me a chance to catch my breath and drink some water. No questions? Does that make sense? Yeah. So uh, when you generate random numbers, so yes. does that algorithm impact this result a lot or not? The algorithm used to generate the random numbers? Right. Um, gosh, that's a good question. Um, my guess is it would not for relatively small sample sizes because the period of the random number generator are, are very, very long. Are you referring to the method like KISS right. or uh, Mersenne Twister or whatever? Um, Stata with release 14 went to the Mersenne Twister as the, the random number, the underlying random number generator. We used to use KISS. I don't know that they make a big difference, and I would suspect that they don't, because both have a pretty long period. Here we've generated a random sample of 10,000. And the, the repeat period for both of these KISS or Mercy and Twister is going to be far more than 10,000. So my guess is it wouldn't make a difference, but I don't know. There's only way to, one way to find out is to try it and see. I'm just curious about their spike at the left of it. There's a spike in this very much. I'm just curious about how... So 0.34 there, it's a Yeah, yeah. I'm just curious yeah. about that. What's causing that? Uh, I think it's just sampling error. Anytime you draw random numbers, you're going to get some funny patterns. And it's not going to be precisely beta 5, 7, but it's pretty close. But you can repeat this again and see probably a funny spike somewhere else. And I don't know that it has to do with the kind of random number generator as much as it's just random sampling error. But that's an interest, that is a good point. In state of 14, uh, we did switch to the Mersenne Twister as the underlying random number generator, which is a more modern, sophisticated, it has a very, very long period of repeats. I don't remember what it is off the top of my head, but it's very, very, very long. But if you, uh, but if you did it, uh, it multiple times, you might get slightly different results because it's random, right? Well, yeah, actually, that's a good point. You would get sometimes very different results yeah. if you didn't set the random number seed. Yeah. So if I ran this and then I ran it again and ran it again, I would get different results every time. So when you're doing this in practice, we'll talk about it later, you want to set the random number seed so that you get the same results, meaning that you start the random number gener generator in the same place. Because it is a random process, and so you're right, you would get different results every time. Some may be better than others. So. So definitely set the random number seed. We'll come back to how to do that here shortly. Yeah. Okay, so Bayes and Stata. So in Stata 14, we introduced the Bayes MH command, and we created this graphical user interface to make it a little easier to use. So at the top, you specify what kind of syntax do you want to use. Do you want to use a univariate distribution like this? Do you want to do a univariate regression or multivariate regression where you have multiple outcomes? Or you can even fit nonlinear regression models. So you pick that at the top. If this was a regression model, we would have both a dependent variable here as well as a box to select independent variables. Then below that, we need to select our likelihood function for our data. Remember, we have a prior and we have a likelihood function for the data. So here we're going to select our likelihood distribution. We're going to use a Bernoulli distribution because Stata sees each observation as a single uh, coin toss, not a collection of 10 coin tosses. So we're going to use a Bernoulli, and we're going to specify the success of probability as theta. And we're going to write the word theta in little squiggly brackets to emphasize that it's a uh, parameter. The next thing we need to do is specify a prior uh, distribution for our parameters. So I can click this Create button, and it will open my prior window. And here I can select which parameter that I want to specify the prior for. And then I have a laundry list of different kinds of priors that I can 
And sometimes if you really have no idea, you can just punt and use what we call a flat prior, and Stata will choose for you whatever the flat version of your uh, uh, prior needs to be. Okay. Uh, but we have a variety of these things built in. And then you can specify, in this case, for my beta, I'm using uh, shape parameter A and B is 1 and 1. That's that flat prior. Okay. So this is how you would set it up using the graphical user interface. This is what, uh, this is what the command would look like. So the command is base The data, or the dependent variable in this case, is heads. That's from my coin toss. I don't have any uh, covariates in this model. It's just, just the outcome. The next line shows the uh, likelihood function. And here I've used a Bernoulli distribution, a Bernoulli density. That's what the D Bernoulli means. And my parameter is theta. I've specified that myself. And I put the parameter in squiggly brackets, so Stata knows that that's a parameter. Next thing I need to do is specify a prior distribution for the parameter theta, and in this case I've used a beta 1, 1, and then that's it. That's the command for fitting this Bayesian model for my coin toss experiment. And then my output from my BayesMH command looks like this. So it's going to show reiterate the uh, likelihood function, the prior. It's going to show me some information about my MCMC run, and we're not going to worry about that right now. But the punchline is here at the bottom. So I have for my parameter theta, the mean of that posterior distribution of those 10,000 samples is going to be 0.418. And then I get a standard deviation, not a standard error, a standard deviation, because we have these 10,000 observations. It's the standard deviation of that, that uh, sample that sample of 10,000. I get my Monte Carlo standard error. I have a median. Stata reports a median as well, because some of these distributions can be skewed, so it's nice to see the median. And then you also get an equal tail, 95% equal tailed credible interval. Not a confidence interval, a credible interval. And the best thing about credible intervals is they actually have the interpretation that most people use for confidence intervals. Most people misinterpret confidence intervals. Uh, but a credible interval is actually act actually is the probability that the parameter lies between those two values. That's its interpretation, which is the misinterpretation of most uh, confidence intervals. So most people desperately want to be Bayesians, they just aren't aware of it uh, <laughs> in their interpretations. Now, major difference with MCMC from maximum likelihood. Maximum likelihood when you run a model, it will converge. It runs until it stops, hopefully stops, and then it's done. You know when it stopped and it's converged. But MCMC isn't like that. MCMC, you just tell it, run 10,000 iterations or 20,000 iterations, and it does that, and then it stops because you told it to stop. But there's nothing about it that says, oh, it's converged, now I'm going to stop. Okay? So when we finish fitting a Bayesian model, we need to go back and look at some diagnostics to make sure that our MCMC chain run was reasonable. The first thing we want to look at is this trace plot. And notice this, has a, this trace plot has a nice sort of squiggly pattern. It doesn't have that random walk to it. That's what we're looking for, something that has pretty good coverage over the parameter space. The next thing we want to look at is the histogram. Does this histogram look like a density of some kind? Not necessarily. We don't know what it is, because in real cases, we don't know what the posterior distribution is. But at least it does look like a density. It doesn't have a cliff that drops off or does anything really bizarre. It doesn't have any weird outliers to it. The next thing we want to look at is the density plot for the first half and the last half of the chain. So these are kernel density estimates for the full sample, which is the solid line. And then the green dashed line is the first half of this trace plot. So if we did a, a kernel density for this half of the chain, that would be the green line. And then the second half of the chain would be this sort of purplish dotted line. What we're looking for are wild differences, big differences between the first and the last half of the chain. Because if they are, that means that we're not getting the same sort of coverage over the entire uh, span of the iterations. I'm sure I'm saying that very clearly. We don't want to see major differences between the first and half, last half of the, uh, the iterations, the trace plot. Then lastly, we need to look at the autocorrelation among the observations. We generated 10,000 samples, but because of the Markov chain way that we generated these, each iteration is dependent on the previous one, right? So that induces a kind of autocorrelation um, within the sample. So if I take two, and I'm going to refer to these as lags. If I take two contiguous points, lag of one, I would expect those to be fairly highly correlated, right? Because one was generated based on the other. But two iterations apart, I would expect to see that correlation drop off. Two, two iterations later. Three iterations later, I'd expect to see it drop off more. And in fact, that's the pattern that I see here. The farther apart two points get in the, the iteration history, the less correlated that they are, which is a good thing. So we want to see an autocorrelation pattern that looks something like this. We don't want to see 
sort of a uniform autocorrelation where it never drops off. That could Im indicate problems with uh, model specification or just problems with the starting values or who knows what, but we certainly need to go back and look at something uh, if we see a high autocorrelation that's not falling off. And there's no problem with the autocorrelation as long as it looks like this because Stata has built it, it takes into account the autocorrelation in all of its uh, calculations. Okay. So that's it for Bayes. Any questions about Bayes? Clear as a bell now, right? <laughs> Ready to go out and run some Bayesian models. So All right. Just one more question. Sure. So yeah. when you run it 10,000 times, is, yes. is it typically what people do, the number of runs? Can you do one million? Is it because of you could run a million if you wanted to. Uh, we chose 10,000 as the default, but that 10,000 is completely arbitrary. It's not an uncommon value that you see in real research, but uh, you can specify whatever you want. You could run 5,000. I'm not recommending it, but you could. Or you could run a million if you wanted, or two million, or however long of a chain you want. Now, there is a point of diminishing returns. If you uh, look at the efficiencies and things like that and the acceptance rate, there comes a point where running 10 million iterations is probably not getting you any better or closer than running 10,000 or 20,000 or something like that. But I guess the point is that, yes, it's arbitrary, and yes, you can override it, and you might want to think that through before you actually choose a number. And you may want to run it different lengths. You may want to try it 10,000 times and try it 20,000 times and see if there's a substantive difference. How long did it take you to run 10,000 times? This particular example runs in a fraction of a second to a second. It's, it's a very simple example, so it runs very, very quickly. Um, the question I'm sure will come up again when we start doing IRT models. One, the one parameter IRT model I'm going to show you here takes maybe a couple of seconds to run. Um, it didn't when we first started playing with them early on, but once we tweaked the code and, and sort of made it a little more efficient for running IRT models, now you can run a 1PL model doing with 10,000 iterations and it's on a couple of seconds maybe. Now that's on, I have a fairly powerful laptop. I would say, oh, I ran it on my laptop, but it's an i7 quad core, I forget how much memory it has, and it's, it's a fairly powerful laptop, but it's a laptop nonetheless, and if you can do these kinds of things on a laptop, you couldn't have dreamed of that 20 years ago. Just, it's amazing what you can do now with computers. Okay, so Bayesian IRT. Now we're going to put these two things together. Two very simple topics. Let's put them together and make another simple topic, right? So uh, Bayesian one-parameter logistic models. So we're, we're talking about the parameter, the probability that yij equals 1. What is yij? yij is just, is the item, did the person answer a particular item correctly? So i indexes items and j indexes participants. So for example, I could ask, what's the probability that person one answered item one correctly. One equals one, meaning answered correctly. What's the probability that uh, person one answered item two correctly? So forth. We're using a logistic function because that's what uh, IRT is, a 1PL model, is a logist one parameter logistic. Uh, so that's what this function is, this exp and one plus all that. It's just a logistic function. And I have separate, the difficulty parameters are indexed with I, meaning I'm going to, just like a 1PL model, and it is a 1PL model, I'm going to estimate a separate difficulty parameter for each of the items. But I'm going to estimate a single discrimination parameter. That's why there's no subscript on the discrimination parameter here. Now, for the priors, uh, I'm going to specify a log normal prior for discrimination, partly because that's just how it's been done in the literature. And then for the difficulty parameters, I'm going to use a normal 0, 1 prior. So that's also how it's been done in the literature. But if you think about it for a minute, remember we said that the theta axis, the ability axis in uh, IRT has a z-score scale to it? So it makes sense that we would use a normal prior for that because that seems to be the reasonable range of values for the difficulty parameter. So these are the priors that we're going to specify. So here is the code for fitting a one-parameter logistic model. So now you're going, oh, wow, I don't want to do that. Um, it's not as scary as it looks once you break it down into pieces. So the first row here, the first line, the command is Bayes MH, and then the model is going to be Y, the outcome, correct or incorrect, is equal to the discrimination times each subject minus their difficulty. Below that, the next line, that's just specifying the equation, I'm going to say that the likelihood function for my data has a logit link function or a likelihood function. And then the next two rows here, these redefines, these are completely optional. All these do is redefine what I mean by diff and subj. 
because it makes the output look a little bit nicer and it makes it easier to write an equation that looks nice and neat instead of having all the factor variable notation in there. You don't have to use the redefines, but it makes things look a little nicer in the equations and the output. Then the next three lines are simply specifying the prior distributions for the, uh, for the parameters. The init statement here is simply initializing what do, I, what do I want to start the discrimination parameter at. When I start the chain, I want to start it at 1, which is a reasonable value. I don't want to start it at some weird arbitrary place. Exclude has to do with what I'm going to save down here. I'm going to save the MCMC sample to disk so I can do some things with it later on. But I want to exclude the subject, each ID, uh, random, very random stuff in there. Don't worry about exclude. It's just keeping the sample a little simpler when I save it. The next, next to the last line here, burn in a 5,000 means that I'm going to run the chain for 5,000 iterations, and then I'm going to just discard those. And then I'm going to, the MCMC size is 10,000, so I'm going to run the iteration 5,000 times, discard those, and then continue on another 10,000 and keep those. The reason that I do that is because I have to pick a random, I have to pick a starting point for the chain from somewhere. Sometimes when you pick a random number, it could be a start in a really strange place. You hope not, but it could. So it may take some time, a number of iterations, for the, the parameter to sort of drift into the main section of the parameter space. And it can sometimes take a number of iterations. So that's why we just discard the first 2,000, 5,000, whatever. And then we keep the remainder. Uh, thinning, uh, we won't talk about thinning. It's a, something else you can do. But the R seed here, R seed 14. That's setting the random number seed inside the base mh command. I prefer to set the random number seed within the command. You can set it at the top of your do file, but often I will highlight this in my do file and just run this one command and not run the whole program. So if I set my random number seed at the top of the program, then every time I run this, just this one command, I'm going to get a different result. So you can also, with the base mh command, specify the random number seed inside the command, and then every time I run just that command, I'll get the same results. That makes sense? So it's optional. You can do it either way, but I choose to put mine inside the command for that reason. And lastly, I'm going to save my MCMC sample to disk so that I can do some things with it later on. So if I run that base MH command, again, I get my likelihood function and my priors at the top. I see some information about my MCMC run. But the punchline here at the bottom, the parameter estimates, look remarkably similar to what I got with maximum likelihood. I get my nine difficulty parameters, and I get my lone uh, discrimination parameter. And again, they're very similar to what I got using maximum likelihood. And this is what the item characteristic curves look like based on my base MH run. And again, they look remarkably similar to that that I got with maximum likelihood, which in this case is comforting because if they were very different, I would be maybe concerned that something's wrong. This is a Bayesian 2 parameter logistic model. Again, the only difference being that I've indexed the discrimination. I'm going to estimate a separate discrimination parameter in addition to separate difficulty parameters. Uh, and so I've tweaked the code a little bit here. I've highlighted the differences. It's the previous command. The red stuff is the new part. And now when I look at my output, as you would expect, you get separate discrimination parameters for each item and separate difficulty parameters. Then when I question, yeah, and all of the that code can be done automatically through the graphical user interface, right? You can pretty much set all those options, you could. check off boxes, and it will generate that code. It well, yes, it would. Yeah. I have never tried that. Where is it here? At least for like the first time. The first time you <laughs> Just could. To see what, um, what comes out. To be honest, I've never even tried using the graphical user interface, but you absolutely could. You certainly could. Um, I find it easier in this case to do to play with the code simply because I know which parts I'm going to need and it was a little quicker. But you're right, you could generate this entire thing using the graphical user interface. Absolutely. Uh, so now I have my item characteristic curves for my two parameter logistic model and again it looks like my maximum likelihood result. This is the equation at the top for a three parameter logistic model so I now have an additional parameter. I'm going to use an inverse gamma distribution to, as my prior for the guessing parameter. But I have a single guessing parameter that's common to all of the items. This is the code, so I've updated the code here. And now I get uh, separate discrimination parameters, separate difficulty parameters, and I get my common guessing parameter here at the bottom. That guessing parameter is equal to about 0.1, which means that that lower left asymptote is actually lifted up from 0 to about 0.1. 
Okay. So that item characteristic curve doesn't go all the way to zero on the left side. Excuse me. It, it, it's it's gone up two point one, or it's gone up by point one. Up uh, up two point one. I think it would be the same thing anyway, because you're starting from zero, okay, so it wouldn't yeah, matter. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I hadn't really thought about that until you mentioned it just now. But either way, it would be the same. Okay. Uh, so now I have my item characteristic curves, assuming a common guessing parameter. So everything I've just done could be done with status IRT, maximum likelihood IRT. So why would I want to mess with all of this? Scary code, scary equations, why do I want to mess with this? Well, I can go a step further now. What this person in Beijing suggested was that I need to be able to fit a separate guessing parameter for each item. And in fact, I can now add this to the equation, I can update my code, and I can fit a 3PL model with a separate guessing parameter for each item as long as I use an informative prior. If I use an uninformative prior, this won't work. But I'm using, for the guessing parameter, still an inverse gamma. And so this is what my output looks like. I've sort of omitted some of the stuff for the discrimination of the difficulty parameter so I can squeeze the rest of this in. So now I get a separate guessing parameter for each item. And they are equal to something like 0 0.107, 0 0.112, 0 0.123, 0 0.119. They're all pretty close to 0 0.1. They're not that different. So my reply to the person who was uh, giving me this advice in Beijing would be that, well, look, they aren't really that different. I don't need to estimate separate guessing parameters. But his response, and I think it's correct, would be the only way to know that is if I run them separately, and now I know. Because unless you run them separately, you don't know that they're all the same. So now we just did something with Bayes that we can't do with maximum likelihood. And it's not a matter of the software. It's a matter of the math. You can't do it that way. Not in SPSS, not in any other software. It's just a math thing. So now we just stepped out of the world of maximum likelihood where we can't do it anymore. We have to use Bayes. So was that really worth the trouble? There's the, uh, there's the spaghetti bowl of, of characteristic curves. So this raises this question very loudly. Do I really want to mess with code that looks like that just to get those separate guessing parameters? Why should we even be using Bayesian IRT and is that reason enough? Well, it turns out there's more. That wasn't the edge of the earth. It turns out there are actually four and five PL models. We just didn't know that because we couldn't fit them using maximum likelihood. But once we're off in the world of Bayes, there are a lot of other things we can do that we didn't even know we could do. So four PL models, in fact, include item specific, or you, they can either be common or item specific parameters from the upper asymptote of the item characteristic curve. Well, why would you want to do that? Well, maybe you have uh, items where nobody gets these things correct. Or something like that. There may be certain scenarios where they're just you're not getting any correct answers and you want to bring that upper right asymptote down. Just like the guessing parameter lifts the lower one up, and so now we're bringing it down. There's also a 5PL model. And if you've never heard of this, don't, be, uh, don't feel too badly. I've gone all over the U.S. now and talked to some really smart, fairly famous psychometricians. And when I mentioned 5PL, I didn't even know there was a 5PL model. They tell you that over dinner. They don't say that out loud in the room. I didn't even know there was a 5PL model. And to be honest, I didn't either until we started dabbling with this. Uh, and what it does is it allows for item-specific asymmetry parameters. Why do we force those logistic curves to be symmetric? Is there a theoretical reason, a conceptual reason why they are symmetric? I don't think there is. I think the only reason we've done it that way is because that's all we knew how to do. It wasn't because we intentionally think they are symmetric. It's just because that's what we could do and that's what we did. Um, I have a colleague who believes that the 3PL model is really just, it's not so much about the guessing parameter, it's just the, the closest thing we can get to an asymmetric model. Okay? And so maybe what we really should be fitting are 5PL models and not messing with separate guessing and all these other things. What we really need to allow for is, is uh, Asymmetry in these curves. The asymmetry is so, around the inflection around point. Around the inflection yeah. point. So the logistic curves are forced to be symmetric. If you were to flip mm -hmm. it around on its side, the upper side and the lower side would look or just upside down mirror images of each other. But there's no real conceptual reason why that has to be true. And in fact, they don't have to be. So here's a 4PL model. Uh, so rather than having a 1 over here for the upper asymptote, we're going to estimate the upper asymptote. And we can do this separately for each item if we want to. We're going to specify a uniform prior on the, the uh, upper asymptote. And so this graph is just showing you what, it, well, this isn't the actual data. This is just 
The blue line is a 3PL model, which would be equivalent to a 4PL model with the D parameter equal to 1. That's if D was equal to 1, sort of a null value. The red line is if the uh, D parameter in the 4PL model equals 0.8. So these are the same exact model with the exception of the D parameter pulling this upper asymptote down. And that's graphically what it's doing, it's pulling that down. Uh, so we can fit this. This is the code. I know it gets more and more scary with every slide. Uh, and the graphs, unless you compare them side by side, it's hard to tell uh, whether how much different this is from the 3PO model. And then we also have the 5PO model. Now look at this. In addition to all this other fun stuff, we now have an exponent inside of our logistic function. Good luck with that with maximum <laughs> likelihood, right? So, uh, but we can do this with Bayes, and we're going to put a uniform prior between 0.8 and 1 for our asymmetry parameter. And now when we fit this using Bayes, these are two graphs that illustrate the, the differences between them. The blue line is, again, a 4PL model, or if you want, a 5PL model with the exponent equal to 1, as if the exponent wasn't there. But if that exponent becomes 0.2, it could bend way over here like this. So the point being is that, X, that E parameter can make the, the curve bend in very unusual ways. Um, so that's what the 5PL model does, allows for that asymmetry. And I guess just to conceptually, like you said, there's no reason why it should be symmetric. But in this case, the explanation would be that I guess some questions after a certain level of ability, everyone gets correct or something like that. Or Could be, but th that doesn't necessarily mean the curves are symmetric about the inflection point. So maybe there's a long, slow uh, curve up to the inflection point, then it just shoots kind of up quickly to the on the right side. Right. So. It, or it could go up really quickly to the inflection point on the lower end and have a long upper tail on the other. The point is that I don't know that there's any conceptual theoretical reason, not mathematical or statistical, no, but yeah. a conceptual theoretical reason why they're forced to be symmetric. No, yeah, my, my question was just what is the explanation for the lack of symmetry, I suppose? Like, you're right, there is no reason. Oh, oh I, to yeah, should yeah. Be. Gosh, just as much as there is for the symmetry. Yeah, <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> it's just, I mean, it's, it's a great question to ponder. Now yeah. we can think about it. <laughs> but it wasn't a question you yeah. asked before. Cause <laughs> it must have been. Now it's right. The, I think the truly honest answer of why they were symmetric is that's what we could do. Right. And we didn't have an option it's to fit them an asymmetric uh, curve, so we didn't know any better. But now we can. <laughs> so here's the code. I know it gets worse and worse. Um, I didn't say these things were easy. I just said we could do them. Uh, but the thing is, and I'm happy to make these slides and the code available, if you're going to do this, you can copy this and, and modify it for your own stuff. Once you stare at it for a minute, you start seeing, okay, here are all these priors. Gosh, I have all these priors now. I need to think through what the priors are for each of these. But you understand what you're doing, and you can modify that fairly quickly. To write this from scratch, if you took me out in the hall and put a gun to my head, I could not write this code from scratch again. And I'm not going to lose it. There are lots of backup copies of that. <laughs> this, uh, this is hard work figuring out how to get all this stuff uh, written in here. So, uh, so here we have our, five, our curves for our 5PL model. Now, if I were a statistician, I'm not a, uh, which I am more so than a, I'm not a content person. I don't know anything about these questions. Uh, but as a statistician, I know I fit a lot of models now. Which model is the best fitting model? Which one should I use? Should I maybe stick with the 2PL model? It's what a lot of people use. And the, uh, the testing industry, 2PL is kind of the standard, largely. Uh, if I'm a Raj person, or Rash, however you pronounce it, uh, most people don't even like to go beyond one parameter. So uh, which, of these, which of these should I be using? Well, for Bayesians, there's a metric that's often used to compare models called the Deviance Information Criteria, or DIC. It was specifically designed to be similar to the AIC and BIC that you're probably familiar with. Um, and it has somewhat similar properties. The main thing is that just like AIC and BIC, lower values indicate better model fit. Lower values and, and absolute value. So these first three models are the 1, 2, and 3 PL model. And then the 3, 4, and 5, the S at the end indicates separate parameters for each item. So I have a 3 PL model with a common guessing parameter and a 3 PL with separate guessing parameters for each. So if I look at the 1PL model, the DIC is 8,122. Going to a 2PL model, it drops off quite substantially. And I'm going to avoid the word significantly because it's a loaded term, but it, it drops off substantially. From 2PL to 3PL, we get about a 5, 5.5 point decrease again in DIC. 
Maybe that's important or substantive or not. I don't know. Uh, I tend to think it probably suggests maybe we should use the 3PL. But when once we get to 3PL, going from 3PL with a common guessing parameter to 3PL with a separate guessing parameter, that makes virtually no difference whatsoever. Going from 3PL to 4PL is actually worse. The DIC went up some. But look, look at what happens when I go to the 5PL model. Now I get a pretty substantial drop off, a 20% drop from the 3PL model in the DIC, which suggests that maybe we should be using the 5PL model to fit these data. This is a fair, I wouldn't call it an old data set, but this is a data set that's been used for a lot of different examples. And this suggests that we should be using these 5PL or asymmetric uh, item characteristic curves. Now this question keeps coming up. The more I do this talk, I, I see to hear this question more and more. If I use a 5PL model, do I still have to use the separate guessing parameters for each one? Or do I have to use the 4PL with separate? What? My answer to that would be, I don't see any reason why you would have to do that. You could specify five parameter with separate asymmetry parameters, but use a common 4PL, a common uh, upper asymptote, or you could even fix that at one if you wanted to just keep it as, basically fit a 2PL model that's asymmetric. You could constrain the 3 and 4 PLs to keep the upper and lower asymptotes at 1 and 0, and then just make them asymmetric. There's no reason you couldn't do that, particularly in a Bayesian framework. So just because you've gone all the way up to 5 PL doesn't mean you have to keep all of the baggage you collected down below. You could constrain these, so basically you're fitting a 2 PL, an asymmetric 2 PL model. Um, so that's a possibility. So, yes? Is it possible it's to be like overfitting when you have when you make the when we make the model more complicated yes. and account for more variation? But I I see very good benefit from I'm not familiar with people one PL two PL model, but uh, yes. one PL two PL it seems pretty good. Uh, yes. But uh, from three to five it's twenty. But if we do out of sample testing, does that result hold? And is it right? Just the short answer is I haven't run this a variety of ways to see what happens. Um, but I believe that DIC, it's been a while since I read the original DIC paper, but I believe it has a penalty for overly complex models. Like BIC penalizes models for having extra parameters in them. I'm almost certain that DIC does the same thing. So there is a built-in penalty for having extraneous parameters to it. I'm pretty sure. I need to double check that. Um, the other thing I would compare is going all the way back up maybe to the 2PL model. So is there a big drop off from 2PL to 5PL because I could constrain these to be 1 and 0. Maybe I don't want to mess with the asymptotes. I just want them to be asymmetric. But you're right. That, that is always a concern when you fit very complex models is that maybe we've overfit them. Particularly if we're allowing for separate guessing and separate upper asymptotes and separate asymmetry. We may be grossly overfitting this. And in fact, my guess, I haven't tried this, but this, uh, this DIC may drop off substantially if we've constrained the 3 and 4 PL, the upper and lower asymptotes, to either be the same across all of them or fix them at 1 and 0. Uh, so there are other things. My point is that these aren't the only possible models we could fit, and we may want to explore that. But uh, using Bayes opens up other possibilities that we just didn't have when we stuck with maximum likelihood. And much like doing survey samples with probability, survey sampling with probability samples, once you've seen it, it's really hard to get it back out of your head. And, uh, I guess I have to take sample weights into account. This is one of those things that once you've seen it forever more in the back of your head, if you only go to a 3PL, you're going to scratch your head and go, oh, maybe, I, maybe I should try a 5PL. I just can't find those slides with the code, and I don't want to have to generate that code. But nonetheless, once you've seen it, now you're, forever more you're probably going to